Hi, my name is Karen, and in this presentation, I will be reviewing SIM5 hydrology quantity modeling. Please note, as I go through the presentation, the page numbers on the top right corner of the slide indicate where in the SWIM user's guide one could find ad additional information on that topic. So to begin with, the hydrology portion of SWIM5 is the runoff portion of the model. The hydrology portion creates the hydrograph that is routed to the hydraulic section of your network. The fundamental assumption is that the subcatchments are simplistic rectangles. It is also important to mention that there is limited feedback between the hydrology, which is your subcatchments, and the hydraulics, which is your conduits, junctions, weirs, outlets, etc. So generally, once the water has left the subcatchment, with few exceptions, the water cannot go back in the subcatchment area. The fundamental assumption is that each subcatchment has its own attribute values representing the entire subcatchment. In reality, a subcatchment may have a number of different hydrology conditions, for example, soil types, slopes, roughnesses, and so on, which are averaged or lumped when they're assigned to a subcatchment. To overcome the effects of averaging parameters on a subcatchment, you may choose to further divide your subcatchment into a finer number, thus representing more physical processes. For most SWIM5 applications, the runoff hydrograph and pollutographs are generated by SWIM5. If you have an external source generating your input hydrographs, you can import these inputs into PC SWIM. For the runoff portion of the model, SWIM5 accepts continuous event-based rainfall or snowfall hydrographs. From there, it accounts for snowmelt, infiltration losses, surface detention, overland flow, channel flow, and any pollutants washed into the node. It then calculates the hydrographs and pollutographs and routes them to the subcatchment outlet. Once subcatchment flows have been generated, it is routed to the subcatchment outlet, which is a node. These node flows and pollutographs can be placed on an interface file for subsequent input. Interface files are files that contain either externally imposed inputs, for example, rainfall or infiltration inflow hydrographs, or are the results of previously run analysis, for example, runoff or routing results. These files can help speed up simulations simplify comparisons of large loading scenarios, and allow large areas to be broken up and analyzed individually. It is also important to mention that SWIM5 can be run for periods ranging from seconds to centuries. There are two time steps that need to be defined that are associated with the hydrology runoff portion of the model, a wet time step and a dry time step. Typically, the wet time step should be less than or equal to the rainfall interval entered and should be a fraction of the rainfall interval. It can be longer, but information will be lost by averaging the rainfall over a longer period. A wet time step is the time step used when there's precipitation occurring on any subcatchment. A dry time step has no precipitation input or surface storage, however it can have groundwater flow. The dry time step should be one day to one week, and smaller times may be required when water quality or groundwater simulation is involved. The dry time step is used to update the infiltration parameters, generate groundwater flow, and produce a time step value for the interface file. If the time steps are too coarse, there's a lot of averaging and it could result in your model becoming unstable. If the time step is too fine, there may be long computational times as a result. SWIM5 has the option of three different infiltration methods for the pervious areas. The Hortons model, the modified Green Amp model, and the SCS curve number. We recommend using the green amp method as it's the most physically based infiltration model. SWIM and many hydraulic analysis techniques have used Horton's equation for computing infiltration capacity into the soil as a function of time. The Horton's model is empirical and is applicable to only events which the rainfall intensity always exceeds the infiltration capacity although the modified form used in SWIM5 is intended to overcome this deficiency. This type of infiltration model describes the exponential decay of infiltration capacity during heavy storms. 
There's little help for determining the infiltration capacity and decay coefficient, and often hydro hydrologists have a feel for its parameters. The green ant equation has the advantage of physically based parameters that in principle can be measured. The main Larson formulation is applicable when the intensity is less than the infiltration capacity at the beginning of the event. The model assumes that the wetting front moves through the soil and builds and travels upwards from the bottom mantle to the surface until the soil mantle is filled. This diagram shows a typical subcatchment scheme as recognized by SWIM. In this illustration, the subcatchment is divided into three subsections. A1 represents the impervious portion of the subcatchment, like roofs, roads, and sidewalks. A2 represents the pervious portion of the subcatchment, like lawns and gardens. And A3 represents the part of the subcatchment that is impervious and has no depression storage. Depression storage accounts for the small storages that are found in impervious areas, like potholes and parking lots. In the case of a steep roof, there would be no depression storage. This diagram shows the cross-section of overland flow off of a subcatchment. Overland flow is generated from each of these three sub-areas by approximating them as non-linear reservoirs. The depth, D, has to exceed the depression storage, DP, before it can generate flow. The depth of depression storage is an input parameter for the impervious and pervious areas of each subcatchment. If the subcatchment width, W, is assumed to represent a true prototype width of the overland flow, then the reservoir will behave like a rectangular catchment. Otherwise, the width, slope, and roughness may be considered calibration parameters. The nonlinear reservoir is established by coupling the continuity equation with the Manning's equation, where the volume of water on the subarea is the surface area multiplied by the water depth. During a simulation, this equation is solved once per time step, where the change in storage is equal to the inflow minus the outflow. The outflow to the outlet is computed as a product of velocity, depth, and width. The outflow is generated using the Manning's equation. These two equations, the continuity equation and the overland flow equation, are combined into a no one nonlinear equation that is solved for the one unknown, which is depth. This produces the first equation, where WCON is a routing parameter, which is a grouping of width, slope, and roughness defined for the pervious and total impervious subcatchment areas. The equation dd over dt is solved at each time step by means of a simple finite difference scheme. For this purpose, the net inflow and outflow on the right-hand side of the equation must be averaged over the time step. The average outflow is approximated by computing it using the average between the old and new depths. By letting subscripts 1 and 2 denote the beginning and end of the time step, respectively, the equation is approximated to the last equation. If the overland flow is visualized as running down slope off an idealized rectangular catchment, then the width of the subcatchment is the physical width of overland flow. Since real subcatchments will not be rectangular with properties of symmetry and uniformity, it's necessary to adopt other procedures to obtain the width for more general cases. This is especially important because the width can be used to alter the hydrograph shape if the slope and roughnesses are fixed. Let's consider the five different subcatchment shapes shown in the following figure. In this example, the subcatchment hydraulic properties, routing parameters, and time of concentration are the same. What we find is, as the subcatchment width is narrowed, the time to equilibrium increases. Thus, Equilibrium is achieved quite rapidly for cases A and B, and more slowly for cases C, D, and E. For case E, the outflow is constricted, hence the same amount of inflow or rainfall is stored, and less is released. For case A, water is released rapidly, and little is stored. Thus, case A has both the fastest rising and recession limbs. One thing to keep in mind is that groundwater flow can be a significant volume 
and can be routed to any previously defined inlet node, trapezoidal channel, or pipe, allowing isolation of the various components of the total hydrograph, shown in the figure above. Aquifers are subsurface groundwater areas used to model the vertical movement of water infiltrating from the subcatchments that lie above them. They also permit infiltration of groundwater into the drainage system or exfiltration of surface water from the drainage system, depending on the hydraulic gradient that exists. The same aquifer object can be used by several subcatchments and are only required in models that need to explicitly account for the exchange of groundwater with the drainage system or establish base flow and recession curves in conduits. Aquifers are represented using two zones, the unsaturated and saturated. Their behavior is characterized using parameters such as soil porosity, hydraulic conductivity, evapotranspiration, depth, bottom elevation, and loss rate to deep groundwater. In addition, the initial water table elevation and initial moisture content of the unsaturated zone must be supplied. Aquifers are connected to subcatchments and to drainage nodes in the subcatchment's groundwater flow property. This property also contains parameters that govern the rate of groundwater flow between the aquifer's saturated zone and drainage node. Now the first image on the slide is the aquifer editor in which the aquifers are defined. Once defined, the aquifer can be assigned to one or more subcatchment. The image on the right shows the groundwater attributes for a selected subcatchment. The groundwater flow attributes are used to link a subcatchment to both an aquifer and to a node of the drainage system that exchanges the groundwater with the aquifer. It also supplies the coefficients that determine the rate of groundwater flow between the aquifer and the node. The following equation is used to calculate the groundwater flow. The coefficients a1, a2, v1, v2, and a3 appear in the following equation to compute the groundwater as a function of groundwater and surface water flow. The following diagram shows a cross-sectional view of a groundwater aquifer. For groundwater to enter the channel, the groundwater elevation in the saturated zone must be reached before it can be exchanged. Please note that groundwater is introduced into the hydraulic system at a node outlet and influences from groundwater does not solely apply to open hydraulics as the figure may suggest. For tables that outline typical hydrology and hydraulic parameter values, you can turn to page 815 in your Swim 5 user's guide. On this slide, you can see a table listing the green lamp parameters for different soil values. This concludes the hydrology water quantity portion of our lecture. If you have any questions, please send us an email at support at chaiwater.com.